so I have been, um, just a little bit about me, um, and then I will jump into things. Um, so I've been really interested in food for my entire career. Coming out of undergrad, I was a Congressional Hunger Fellow here in the city. Um, so it was a very short-term resident. I uh, don't actually know what ward I was in, so not a very good resident, clearly. <laughs> um, but I've been in Philadelphia for quite some time now. Prior to coming to the reinvestment fund, um, I worked for a grocer named Jeff Brown who operates 11 grocery stores in the Philadelphia market. Um, and he was providing consulting services through a nonprofit for other operators to connect to healthy food financing programs. Um, I've been at reinvestment fund for about two years now. Um, so a little bit about us, if you don't know, um, we are a community development financial institution, which essentially means that we are a mission-related investor. We focus on providing uh, capital to projects in low and moderate income communities. Um, we do, in addition to food, we provide uh, financing for uh, low income housing, market rate housing where appropriate, charter schools, health centers, um, things like that. Um, a little bit about our overall portfolio. Um, we've been around for 31 years um, and invested over 1.8 billion in community investments. Um, in food specifically, um, we have done 163 projects um, representing over 250 million in investments. Okay, so I'm probably preaching to the choir on this slide, um, but I thought I would just start with this. Um, why, we're impact why we're interested in food retail is a number of reasons. Um, but there are two main ones, right? So it's got a huge economic impact for the communities that we're hoping to serve. Um, we've done some research over the years. We know that it creates jobs. It increases housing values or will stabilize housing values in markets where they're diminishing. Um, and we will also see them be commercial anchors for other retail developments. There are also health impacts. These are a little bit harder to test and you'll see a variety of studies that have a variety of different statistics. But there are some, and when you look at the uh, literature, that you'll see that there are correlations between healthy food access and healthier weights. So reinvestment fund, we are a loan fund. Uh, we are one of the largest in the country. So the majority of our work in this space is through our financing. Um, however, we've also done a, a great amount of research and analysis in this area. Uh, we jumped into healthy food financing in Pennsylvania without having done that. And then we went back and said, okay, well, why did we do that? How did we do that? What should we have done? And what are the impacts that we've done? Um, so I would, I would uh, recommend that if you haven't been to either healthyfoodaccessportal.org or our website, um, we have a number of research projects there, um, including the limited supermarket access study, um, which is similar to the USDA, um, but takes into account not just need, but poten potential market viability of new food retail. Uh, we've done some capacity building throughout CDFIs. Uh, we run a network of 19 CDFIs across the country that are doing healthy food access. We provide technical assistance and sometimes capital to them. Um, and then we've worked on some public policy and advocacy campaigns to elevate healthy food financing from the statewide Pennsylvania to now federal and to a number of different uh, locations. Okay, so the meat and bones. Um, so I know some of you have heard from grocery retailers. Um, and so I hope that some of this information aligns with, with what you heard from them. Um, but if you look at the, at the food retail market, um, it's an incredibly thin margin to business. Um, and so this is the average net income is one to 2% of sales. And we're gonna take a look at different food retail models and how that actually ends up looking. Um, but what you see is that when stores go into markets where either their expenses or their projections or their sales or their gross profit get a little bit off their format, all of a sudden that one to 2% can, fall, can uh, fall away very quickly. And so what we need to do in thinking about how to incentivize and support operators is to understand their margins, understand how we can keep them where they need to be so that they can be sustainable in the communities we want to serve. In 2008, we did a research study to look, and this was after we started Healthy Food Financing, um, to look at um, was there really a financing gap? Were there really higher costs in developing in lower income and urban communities than there were in other markets? And what we found is that there were. Um, so there are higher employee training costs. There may be higher real estate costs. This is uh, most likely an urban issue more than anything else. Um, land assembly, things like that. Um, and security costs. And then there are ongoing, so there are higher startup costs and there are also ongoing operating costs. 
Um, so urban stores have typically more density, more volume. People are coming through them more often, but maybe because you're walking home or taking public transportation, you're not buying a car full of groceries, right? So you're coming, you're going to the store more times, but you're buying less each time. However, for the store, those transaction costs um, create added costs for them for the same amount of sales. Um, and then we also see maintenance costs. So you're in the store multiple times, the more people in the stores, the higher the maintenance costs. There's also an issue, and we'll, we'll continue to talk about this a little bit, is um, a shift in purchasing habits. So when you enter a grocery store, around the outside of the store, those are all the high margin departments. So it's not an accident that you walk into produce and then you walk past deli and um, fresh meat. And so all of those um, departments have higher gross profits for the operator. So if they're in a market where all of a sudden uh, more people are buying the grocery items in the middle of the store and less of those fresh products that are higher margin, their gross profit may be a little bit shifted. Um, and so that will ultimately end up hurting their bottom, bottom line. So we're gonna take a look at that. Um, and so I'm gonna use very simple numbers just to walk us through this a little bit. Um, so in food retail, there's really three types of stores that the industry talks about. Um, this is not all inclusive, but for the most part, we've got traditional grocery stores, which are your you know, typical Safeway, Giants, ShopRites in the, of the world. You've got natural and organic stores. These can be co-ops, these can be Whole Foods, any Moms Organics, things like that. And then you've got limited assortment. Um, and those are less service departments. Um, these are the Save A Lot, all these are the world. They're typically smaller, less service departments. Um, and they have all slightly different financial um, realities. So for, um, and I'm gonna just say, if at any point I make no sense or you have a question, please ask. Because um, this is a lot of numbers. Um, so if you're looking at a traditional store and they have $100 worth of sales, first thing is the cost of goods. Um, and so all of these numbers were taken from actual stores in our portfolio. So if you look at a traditional store and you've got $100 worth of sales, $72 of that goes to their cost of goods. So you now got, you have $28. Out of that $28, they need to then pay personnel, operating expenses, and their net income. I'm just trying to get the slides off the light. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Every other light's going off. <laughs> yeah, it's very dramatic. It is. <laughs> is that better? Great. All right. Sorry, I thought it was like you're done. Like I don't care. <laughs> um, and so, all right. So here we go. We've got a traditional store that's losing money. Typically. This is where other income comes in. And when you think about other income, think about uh, the um, money that comes in from the Coke and Pepsis of the world for that really large display that you see in the front of the store. Um, think about uh, bill pay, um, cigarettes, things like that. That all comes in here. And in a lot of stores, that makes the difference between a loss and a profit. And this is a healthy, regular store. Dollar twenty cents profit off a hundred dollars. Natural and organic is a little bit different. So hundred dollars worth of sales, their cost of goods may be around sixty-three dollars of that. That's not because they have a better cost of sales. That's because their gross profit is higher. So the food that they're selling, on average, co collaboratively, create a higher gross profit for that <coughs> store. They typically have higher personnel costs. Um, so this was actually taken out of a co-op model. Um, and so you see a commitment to typically higher wages. You also see more service departments, so more prepared foods, more services. So their personnel is gonna be higher. Operating expenses, about the same. This is their rent, their utilities, their supplies, all of the things they need to do. They're able to have a little bit of a profit, typically get less of that um, supplier benefit, other uh, income, a little bit better of a margin. Run through limited assortment. So for that same $100 worth of sales, their cost of goods is $80.50. So they have an incredibly thin margin. 
However, if you think about the type of store and if you've ever been in a Save-A-Lot or an Aldi or that similar type of store, they have less service departments, right? They don't have as many employees in there. So all of a sudden their personnel costs are about $8.50. Operating expenses also a little bit less. Have a loss, they're able to make that up a little bit and we've got a 30 cent profit. Again, this is not a store that I would look at and say is struggling terribly. This is about right, a little, little low, but this is about right. So when we think about supporting grocery retail, the, the way to do it and the way to think about it is that you can either, you have to work on decreasing the cost for the store. So those operating costs, you need to keep as low as possible for them. And we can think about that in a couple different ways. So you can either decrease the amount that they need to borrow to cover those startup costs because then they have less debt to repay. You can decrease the cost of the debt so they have a lower debt burden to pay. Or we can, you can work with the developer of the space, provide them a way of bringing their costs down so the rent to the, and to the tenant is making up some of that difference. Um, and we typically see a healthy rent rate about 2% of projected sales for a grocery retailer. You guys have any questions about that? So you mean you try to put the burden a little bit more on the landlords? We can. So it can be either helping the landlord out, so if we're able to provide um, creative financing or incentive for the landlord, we then require that it pass that it um, passes down to the borrower or to the tenant with a lower rent. So maybe if market is twenty dollars a square foot, they can offer to provide it at fifteen or twelve. Do you guys do anything to help out with the labor costs in terms of getting grants to focus on training or any other ways to sort of decrease that big net? Yeah. So we have. So let me, let me, so in Pennsylvania, um, more than a decade ago, uh, we, had, we had some meetings saying, uh, identifying this issue of lack of access to grocery stores um, and in some of our communities. And this was actually before food deserts was really an identified thing. Um, this was predating a lot of the um, conversations that are happening now. Um, and so what they did, it was uh, the organization, the Food Trust in Philadelphia, um, along with Reinvestment Fund and one other um, Philadelphia-based organization, um, came together and brought the grocers in the room. And the grocers were saying all of these things, and it was before we had done all the research to say, oh, they were kind of honest. Um, and so what was established was this financing fund. And the idea was that we would try to use um, creative financing to bridge these gaps. Um, and the state of Pennsylvania provided $30 million in grants um, to reinvestment <coughs> fund that then leveraged it with $90 million of private <coughs> investments. And what we did was we created a pool of grants, loans, and used our new market tax credits um, to incentivize projects. Um, through that program, we did 88 projects statewide. Um, and they looked a little bit different each time. So we um, provided um, you know, grants to support job training or in-store dietitians where it made sense. Um, but we also provided grants to decrease um, the amount that certain stores would have to borrow. And we provided um, loans that were at below market rates um, or new market tax credits for large projects, um, which offset some of the costs of development. Um, in existing stores, um, so a lot of the other issue is, especially in less urban, usually rural areas, we see a lot of uh, stores that are on the verge of going out of business. Um, and there we did a lot of um, equipment financing to help them get more energy efficient equipment. Because if we can increase or decrease their utility cost, that's another one of those, even just a percentage of their sales, that's another one um, that's going to impact the bottom line. Um, so we've done a number of financing through this program. Um, this now revolves, so as loans repay, we then reinvest it. Um, we've also done a, a similar program in New Jersey um, with the help of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Again, we had a piece of uh, grant and a piece of low interest loan that we were able to couple together and provide into projects. How do, how do you pick and choose where you decide to help? 
or invest? Like, what's it, like how do you pick and choose? So we have some priorities based on our programs. Um, so as just as reinvestment fund, we look for in a, a reason, a, a demonstration of need. So for a healthy food lending, that means that there needs to be a lower moderate income community um, and needs to have less access to grocery stores, which doesn't mean there isn't one. It means that um, the, the market shows that there's not as equitable access for residents in this community than other residents. Um, we will also um, support small businesses. So sometimes if it's an existing operator who's been in business for a number of years, um, that, that, that's also a mission fit. Um, we underwrite the loans though. Um, I want to say similar to a bank would underwrite a loans, but we are way more flexible and thoughtful and creative in our underwriting to make sure we fully understand um, our borrower. Um, so it's both a mission and a credit question. Um, and a lot of times we will underwrite a project and they will ask for a loan and we're underwriting. We say, well, you can't take on that amount of loan. It's not responsible. Um, we'll actually put you in a position where we could put you in jeopardy. Um, so we'll couple that with a small um, grant or, or something like that. So I'm interested to hear, um, do you have any experience with what the city council has established here in the city of DC, which is called the supermarket, supermarket tax credit bill? And for the first decade, a project with the DC policy specifically. Um, we've seen it in New York as well. Similar types of programs. We've seen similar programs in a number of other ways. It's another tool that can be used. Um, and depending on how the legislation is written and how the protocol is written, it depends on who <coughs> takes advantage of it. Um, we do see a lot of larger companies learning about healthy food financing and figuring out ways to benefit it from it. Um, I don't always think that's bad. I think that they are, you know, at, at times they are providing really great access, really great affordable, healthy options. Um, and then, you know, what I think the main priority should always be is making sure that the smaller entrepreneurs and the entrepreneurs that are serving the, co the communities most in need have the same access to that and maybe an additional tool. We're gonna actually talk about that later tonight. Um, so um, it, it's, it's something we've been talking about. Okay, good. Because yeah. you're more the expert than I am with the DC policy. Okay, what's the st point. like? I'm curious. What's the starting point? Like, we need more grocers in, in a couple of our wards, right? Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, I was just looking. Uh, okay. That was the whole topic. Yeah, that's I mean, really the whole. So you need to find like a certified operator that's willing to to go to those wards and and put their their business there, right? Mm -hmm. Do you help connect, make those connections? I guess. Um, so we don't do a lot of that. Um, we have at times where, you know, especially in, you know, markets that we've done programs in, we have enough operators that we can kind of pitch the idea, but we're not a broker. Right. Um, and what we have done, um, and I think we can be more useful in, um, is some of the data and analysis of um, running, you know, what could be a potential feasible size and type of format for a given location. Um, and so there's there's a tool um, called the Huff Analysis. Mm -hmm. um, and it uses the gravity methodology, which is the same that the industry uses, um, to create what a likely um, trade area would be given a store location and a store size. Um, and then from that can generate um, probability of shoppers, you know, in, in, in within that market, um, and then what the potential sales could be of that store. 
um, which then is a tool that you can use in conversations with potential operators. Okay. Well, let's let Sonic continue, and then maybe we'll have time for our questions, more questions at the end. Okay, great. Um, so I have a couple of case studies that I thought would, would be helpful to look at. Um, so in Chester, Pennsylvania, um, which is south of Philadelphia, and it's a small city, um, there was no grocer that was able to enter this market, mainly because there were a lot of um, larger grocers surrounding Chester, but none that were located within the city. So it did not make sense for an operator to go into the actual city um, for a number of different reasons. So our local food bank, Phil Abundance, actually established a nonprofit grocery store. Um, and so for that store, um, what we did was we actually provided a bridge loan. So this is a place where they were getting a lot of grants for the support, but they didn't have enough grants to start the project. So we bridged that uh, with a loan that they then repaid as they were getting foundation support. Um, and we also used the New Market Tax Credit pro uh, Program. Um, and anyone who's not familiar with that, it's a really great tool for large projects. So anything over five million um, typically makes sense. Um, and healthy food financing is a priority of that program um, and is a whole nother three hour long presentation. So we can talk about that at any point, um, but not tonight. Um, and so that, that, that was one of our models where we were able to provide both flexible financing and also an incentive project uh, package. Um, in Bethlehem, PA, um, smaller city, um, here we helped uh, reopen a dark store. So that is a lot of what we do, um, but we do that with operators that have experience. So one thing that I will stress, um, it's really hard, as you saw in this, um, when we went through the margins, this business is a very unforgiving margin uh, business. And so startup stores, we've seen some work and we love to support them. They're very, very difficult. Um, and I typically don't recommend doing that. So um, with some caveats. So, but having an operator um, enter an existing store, um, is a really great way, um, and here we were able to provide low-income financing. So that's all this project needed. It did not need a large grant. It did not need anything. They were going into a former location. They needed to uh, re-equip re and fit out and provide inventory. Um, so here is a cooperative um, that we worked with in Philadelphia. Is We have a number of uh, co-ops in our portfolio. Uh, Mariposa is in West Philadelphia, so it is in a very low-income market, but has the University of Pennsylvania nearby, so we have a number of um, college, graduate, and professors that live in the market. Um, and they were, they grew from a 500 square, square foot space that they had been in for about 25 years um, to a 2,500 plus, it's 27 or something, 100 square feet. Um, and there we provided um, financing for them to be able to purchase the building. As a co-op, they didn't have access to traditional financing because there's no guarantors, there's no, no people liable um, on that debt. Um, and so we were able to provide them um, financing for that. Um, and we were actually able to get the city um, to come in in a subordinate position on that project. So here's one of our, fam our favorite chains, not really, but Kroger <laughs> in uh, Atlanta. Um, so here's a project where, on the surface, you wouldn't have said, oh, Kroger really needs a public incentive. However, the location that they were looking at in Atlanta um, had a number of environmental issues. So the site work for that store was creating a performa that didn't work. They would not have been able to open the store. So what we did was we carved out an incentive just to support their environmental remediation <coughs> so we could bring that back to a traditional cost and let them bring in the rest of their private capital to do the rest. It's also a very large project with lots of jobs. In a <laughs> Are there terms on a deal like that for you all? Um, so yeah, so, so it was a new market deal which is we're able to put a little bit more um, community benefit agreements clauses in those um, because it's such a scarce resource. Right. Um, so we had some local hiring requirements in that um, because that made, the, that made the most sense for this. They have, I don't know if it says it on here, they have a gajillion jobs, 215 yeah. permanent jobs in that store. 